I think as horrific as the pandemic was, it gave us an opportunity to look at some innovations that we might want to think about building on in the future. So what have we learned from this is a key question. From the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, this is Lessons in Lifespan Health, a podcast about the science and scientists improving how we live and age. I'm Professor George Shannon, Kevin Shu Chair in Gerontology. On today's episode, how Professor Kathleen Wilbur is working to improve health outcomes and quality of life for vulnerable older adults. Kate Wilbur is the Murray Pickford Chair in Gerontology and Director of the Secure Old Age Lab at the USC Leonard Davis School. She's also the co-director of the National Center on Elder Abuse, which is housed at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. She recently spoke to us about her research, including her work exploring ways to provide long-term care services and supports that allow older adults to be as independent as possible, and the challenges and opportunities that technology provides in this area. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, George. Happy to be here. Great. Well, I'd like to start by asking you to explain what long-term services and supports encompass and the role they play in the lives of many older adults? So you start with an easy question, right? It's complicated, but long-term services and supports can be an overarching umbrella term for a variety of things that older adults who have multiple chronic conditions and or mobility issues or sometimes cognitive impairment may need. And it includes everything from hospital discharge rehabilitation, time in a skilled nursing facility, assisted living, a number of different types of senior living communities, as well as a whole range of home and community-based services that help older adults stay at home for as long as possible. And that includes things like congregate meals or home-delivered meals, It can include daycare, it can include help with housekeeping, help with personal care in the home. So as you see, it's a wide range of services and supports to help older adults be as independent as possible and give them the services they need to be able to carry on with the meaningful and important things that are in their lives. You know, I I imagine that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted each of those areas. We know that nursing home residents were disproportionately affected by COVID-19, but older adults who live at home but rely on community services were also particularly vulnerable. What challenges did the pandemic create in providing services and what were the main ramifications? So the pandemic, I think, confronted us with a variety of challenges and opportunities to learn from it to do better going forward. So starting with the challenges, I think many listeners will be familiar with the outbreak of COVID. The first recognized COVID case was in a nursing facility in Washington state. And then because of the nature of facilities, people living close together, nurses and other providers going room to room, COVID really devastated nursing facilities, as well as the vulnerability of people who live there, who have often chronic health conditions, who are there because they need health support. And so we saw, especially early on in the pandemic, The majority of cases happened in skilled nursing facilities and some assisted living. And I think we learned a lot about the role of these facilities, how difficult it is when people can't go in and out. Families were restricted from going into facilities. There's lots of heartbreak around what we saw with COVID. And at the same time, people living in the community and home and community-based services. And I will add that some people brought their family members, loved ones home because of the concerns about COVID in community living sites. So there was the added, sometimes added burden for family members to care for an older adult who was brought home because of concerns about risks in facilities. Or sometimes you saw older adults living at home and being more isolated because the kinds of activities that they engaged in were prohibited, especially during the lockdown 
that we saw. So there was concern about isolation. I think we learned a lot, though, about home and community-based care and how what's referred to as the aging network of services really stepped up. And I know in Los Angeles, people weren't able to go to congregate meal sites. So the providers in the AAA contracted with restaurants who were also hurting because of lockdown. They didn't have customers. And the restaurants actually provided meals that were delivered to people in their homes. There were also, I think, very interesting intergenerational connections because who else was feeling isolated and lonely? Well, students and other people that weren't used to accommodating a lockdown. So I know at USC and in other colleges and universities, sometimes high schools, there were connections with older adults and younger adults or even younger people, weekly phone calls, kind of friendly visiting, reaching out. So I think as horrific as the pandemic was, it gave us an opportunity to look at some innovations that we might want to think about building on in the future. So what have we learned from this is a key question. I'm working on a project right now that involves intergenerational communication. And it's so important and I think so vital to gaining a greater understanding of both older adults and young people. Are there any other long-term changes that have been implemented in response? That's a really great question because we learned a lot. How do we build on it? What do we learn from it that takes us into the future? And I think a lot of what we saw were challenges that we already knew were there, how fragmented services are, how older adults can be at risk of isolation, how important the home community-based services and programs and opportunities to interact are for everybody. And I think showing the importance of community, which we didn't have during the pandemic, except, you know, a bit on social media and phone calls and maybe people getting together outside. So the key question is, how do we take the learning and the recognition of what we already knew into the future to build on these important lessons to do better with our aging service delivery. I was going to say our aging service delivery system, but that's a huge problem. There isn't a system. There's just a lot of different components of a system. Well, that kind of brings up this idea of, can any of these lessons learned be used to guide aging policy decisions going forward? You and I first met in an aging policy class, as I recall. So I'm sure you have something to say about this. That was a few years ago. And I think one of the first things I'll have to say is that a lot of things that we identified decades ago are still issues. So we said, oh, the population is aging. We have to prepare for an aging population. And until recently, I felt like we didn't do that great a job preparing. But I see a lot of exciting innovations, which to some extent may have been Jump started a little bit because of the challenges of the pandemic. So we've got a program called PACE, Program of All Inclusive Care for the Elderly, which is, it has been around for decades, but very slow to kind of take off. And this program is for people who could be in a nursing home. They have a high level of care needs, but they can live in the community. They have their services coordinated and integrated and the services that people need who have multiple chronic conditions and sometimes need memory care are all there in one place and they have case management and the program works with the family. So we have programs like that that have been in place for a long time that I think are starting to get jump started because the recognition of how critically important they are We have a variety of models of senior living, and I think we're going to see more innovation there or the innovations that have been developed take off because they did better in the pandemic too. So if we look at what kind of care was best for older adults who maybe were isolated or need long-term services and supports during the pandemic, how do we build on that? And how do we make sure that we translate what we know into reasonable programs 
and policies. And I guess one more thing is that there was an infusion of federal dollars because of the recognition that people were hurting. It was an emergency. They needed help. And in many cases, that really helped and it made a difference. And we're still looking at the impact of the federal dollars in long-term services and support. So I think there will be a lot of important lessons learned. We're pretty close to the pandemic still. I think we need to step back and say, where does this take us? How do we build on it? How do we enhance what we already knew was pretty effective and what other innovations might be out there? I think you're kind of taking us into technology. You've written that the pandemic accelerated the aging network's transition to technological adoptions. Can you describe some of the ways that technology did or can help people successfully age in their homes and communities? For many of us, technology is both a wonderful innovation and challenging. And I'm sure most people have heard about the digital divide, which is that some people are not using, for a variety of reasons, the opportunities that technology provides. So here we are, and actually we're on Zoom, and Zoom has become an important part of our lives for many of us. But there are still a fairly large proportion of older adults who don't have access to any sort of computer. Some have smartphones. And there is this notion, I guess, if we build it, they will come, or if we give it to them, they'll use it, would be the way of talking about that. But there's a variety of barriers. And if you hand somebody a box with a computer in it and say, there you go, you're now going to go on the other side, the right side of the digital divide, they're not. So what can we learn about how to help people use technology in a way that is useful for them, effective, meaningful. So um, the governor of California signed an executive order saying that older adults would be provided, low-income older adults would be provided with useful technology. iPads is one of the things, and we're actually evaluating that. And some of the interesting things are what kind of training and support do people need? In another project we worked on, we talked about how many of us need somebody at your elbow to walk you through things, to make you feel comfortable, to kind of be there and be supportive. We've done focus groups with mixed groups of older people, some who adopted technology and some who are reluctant to better understand how did that work. And the adopters were able to say, here's what I worried about. Here's how I was able to address it. So currently we're evaluating this iPad program that's part of the governor's initiative to see, does it impact healthcare use, telehealth? Does it impact people's sense of loneliness? How do they use it? What do they use it for? What are their perceived benefits and challenges? What are the training issues that people encounter? And I think there's so many questions that we need to learn from in terms of how people adopt technology. And of course, some don't want to, and and they never will, and they're perfectly happy not doing that. But then there's a whole range of ways that this can be of interest to people and also a way to connect. What are some of the implementation challenges around this integrating technology? And what kind of research are you doing? You spoke a little bit about it. In fact, you you mentioned three or four different areas that you're working in. Is there anything else that you're doing that uh, you didn't mention? Well, a couple of things. One is people not only need to have some kind of device, they need to have broadband. It needs to work. And we've seen that some parts of the country, especially in rural areas, it's harder to actually have broadband. It's not available. So all the things we take for granted, electricity, water, et cetera. How much is this an essential service that we'll do a better job providing across the nation in areas where it doesn't exist very effectively now? And then, as I said, how do we help people learn? And what are the particular cultural competencies required for trainers? What are the different uses that people want? This gets back to being person-centered and engaging the people that will be the end user, users and understanding what's most effective for them. So it's the focus groups, but also we're going to be evaluating what are the barriers to uptake? How do people make it work? How do they overcome it if they do? And what can we 
learn from that. We're also doing a study of telehealth in skilled nursing facilities. And, and there's also a notion, not wrong, I think, that this is an incredibly important tool that will make things easier for residents of nursing facilities as well as providers. But there's also a lot of barriers and why this is difficult. And when we have such staff shortages and the great resignation impacting nursing facilities who are really, I think, hurting because they didn't have a huge margin of staff excess capacity, and now that's gone, whatever they did have. So this will be a time saver. I think that's pretty clear. But the nursing facilities have to invest in it. The staff have to invest in it. They have to learn how to do it. And one of the things we're seeing is they thought the residents would be the most resistant, and they're not. They're like, okay, if I can see my doctor this way, fine. But I think the question is, how is it used? Where is it most effective? And where is it not a good replacement for a physician coming to the facility? So there's a fair amount of literature developing on this, but I think there's so many exciting innovations that are rolling out and we need to build on what we're learning and make them better and be more effective in the next generation of telehealth and facilities in helping people on the digital divide connect. So all these things are really exciting opportunities to learn how to connect. Well, it really sounds great listening to you talk about all the work that you're doing. Let me ask you, what is the aim of the Secure Old Age Lab? Can you talk about some of the other focus areas that you're involved in? I think some people zero in. If you think about a microscope, you've got people looking at cells, My lab and my work is more what I call the 35,000 foot level. So if you look at someone with multiple chronic conditions, you look at these services, and I said there's no system, we need to start connecting the dots. We need to understand how they fit together. I can't tell you how many hearings and lectures and articles I've participated in to say the system is fragmented and there's gaps and it's not connected and You need to be reassessed over and over. So the Secure Old Age Lab looks at across the board services, health and long-term services and supports and other areas that impact older adults, elder mistreatment, for example, the digital divide, and looks at them individually, but then also how do they impact each other? Better long-term services and supports, better support of caregivers will reduce elder mistreatment. And we're seeing that. So it's important to look at individually and to do research studies on effectiveness, and then to think about the gestalt and how we put together systems and services and policies that can be cross-cutting and integrating and do a better job. And then also at the same time, the ability to individualize because everyone has different needs. So the specific packages of services and supports they need will be different. So the Secure Old Age Lab's major purpose is in the name that people have healthy, happy, vibrant, meaningful old age. And what are the pieces and what are the connections are what we're interested in. You know, I I remember you're talking many times about silos of care how so many of the care models were isolated from each other. What is person-centered care and why is it so important? So the idea behind person-centered care is that people have different needs, of course. They also have different preferences, different preferences for care and for services and for supports and for contributing and giving back. And primarily and mostly, as with all of us, for controlling their lives and the decisions that are made. So person-centered care recognizes that the power should live with the individual in terms of the ability to make decisions about care, informed decisions. But I think sometimes we as professionals can see, oh, this would be best for this person. And professionals are extremely busy also. And so it kind of overlooks sometimes the person's needs and preferences. And working in areas like elder mistreatment and elder self-neglect, a lot of times 
people have legitimate reasons for wanting things that we don't necessarily think would be the best choice. But person centered asks us to really get in touch with what's behind those preferences and to what extent can we ethically honor them. And this is something I see the field doing a much better job thinking about and working on and great things have been written. And the American Geriatric Society a few years ago had an expert panel come together and develop a definition and sort of protocols for this. And I think that's really moving the field. One more thing I'll say is that ageism contributes here. So we make assumptions about older people that they can't express their preferences adequately. And providers talk to the caregiver, not the older person, or they say, this is what needs to be done. So I think there's also a culture change of recognizing that it's about the older person. And we start with the older person. And that's not to say that there aren't age-related increased likelihoods, but not inevitabilities of, you know, memory issues and things of that kind. So we need to be clear that the person has the capacity to express their preferences. But we start with person-centered. The elder is the person who whatever is happening is happening on behalf of or for or with. And that's where we start. To kind of pick up on that, what is the age-friendly initiative and how are you involved? Age-friendly came out of the World Health Organization And then in the United States, AARP was a big promoter of age-friendly. And the idea is that our communities are often not age-friendly. And we've looked at, you know, things in the home, home modification and things. But what will it take to build a community that has components, you know, health and housing and transportation and civic engagement? And there's actually eight areas that are more age-friendly so that older adults can navigate and engage with and feel at home in age-friendly communities. Paul Lawton talked about the importance of the environment. And sometimes what we want to think about is we let's not work so hard on changing individuals. Let's change the environment to support people with a variety of needs and attributes and skill sets and things to feel at home in our community. So age friendly is everything from curb cutouts, which benefit somebody who maybe navigates in a wheelchair with a walker and someone with a bicycle and someone pushing a baby stroller. So the idea is that age friendly communities are better for everybody. And in Los Angeles, we wanted to make it even more proactive. So the Los Angeles age friendly movement is called Purposeful Aging LA which brings the meaningfulness and the leadership that older adults bring to age-friendly. And that if older adults push age-friendly, again, that benefits the community across the age range and that we have better communities by doing this. There's one other piece I want to add, which is the age-friendly university system. And so USC is age-friendly and there's age-friendly states. So this is, a, I think, an important movement It's very interesting that a lot of what's taking off in aging, age-friendly is taking off, and we need to put our money where our mouth is with it. But other areas, too, that were developed by older adult communities, like the village movement, which connects people in a community to help and support each other and buy access to some needed services. PACE was a community-developed, older adult-developed program, the PACE program I mentioned earlier. So I think if we stay close to older adults and we see what they're interested in and the experiences they bring, we'll do a better job in building out these services and supports and ultimately systems. Well, clearly your work is really at the intersection of research and policy and practice. What role can researchers play in the implementation of evidence-based solutions? Research is essential because we want to know, does something work? Does it work in the way we thought it did work? Who does it work for? How do we do it? So I think researchers can systematically and objectively look at that. But then there's the piece of translating research. And we always hear, oh, well, we don't want it to just end up on the shelf. Unfortunately, a lot does. So how do we engage with policymakers? And how do we engage with 
local and state and federal officials who are writing regulations? And how do we share our knowledge in a way that's accessible? And how do we engage with the consumers of what we're learning, both on the learning end, tell us what you know, and on the other end, here's what we're seeing. And there's actually a big movement that we're seeing it more in Europe, but it's co-design. It's bringing older adults to the research table and saying, help us frame the questions, help us understand kind of what we should be looking at here, and then help us analyze the data. And there are some really exciting movements in the United States, too, looking at bringing older adults to the table, learning from them, engaging them, co-designing research, co-designing programs, co-designing policy. And I think we'll all be better for that. But as researchers, we need to have our work be more accessible, understandable, and clear. Yeah, I mean, it really sort of makes sense, doesn't it? If you're trying to help older adults to bring a few of them in and find out what they really want or need. And George, I want to make one more thing clear. So I've talked about long-term services and supports, memory care, things of that kind. And most older adults at any given time are fully independent and don't need those services. But we're an aging society. And as we age and as we achieve advanced old age, many of us will need at one time or another those services. So it's kind of about all of us. We had a t-shirt in gerontology a while ago. We've meant the aging and they are us, which I love. And so thinking about how do we have all those services and supports in place for people who need them? And many years ago, Eileen Crimmins gave a talk and she said, it's not linear. People have impairment and then they get better. And so there's a whole kind of iterative approach to who needs what. Somebody breaks a hip, they need rehab, they're in a skilled nursing facility for a time, they come out, engage back in the community. So I want to be clear about how these services and supports provide what we need at any given time in our lives and that we're more likely to need them as we age. But I don't want to imply that older adults are in any way similar on any of this. Everybody has unique and individual needs at any point in time and over time. You know, I interviewed a young man a couple of years ago who was on a television show and a very successful show. So I asked him about disability and he said, well, you know, all of us are disabled. Some of us may not realize it yet. But eventually we will. And it seems quite true, doesn't it, that disability is going to affect all of us at one time or another? Well, I think the people living with disability and the community has done a great job about educating us about different needs. You know, people bring different assets to the table, different benefits. And if we can kind of see each other as unique, having our own talents, needs, preferences, and ability to inform and improve the bigger community by sharing those. And again, I think Age Friendly emphasizes that. The disabled community has emphasized, here's what we need, and here's what we contribute. And I think there's a lot of isms we're doing better with, but we still have a long way to go. And ageism is clearly one of them. So Kate, I know you've been doing an awful lot of work in research. Can you Cite a few examples or discuss a little bit about caregiving. I know it's such an important concept that so many young people, as well as older people, are involved in because of the need within families to take care of each other. Thank you for that question, George. A few years ago, we had the opportunity to work with the California Task Force on Family Caregiving. And it's a great illustration of researchers and legislators and policy people and people in the community representing different sectors coming together. So the California legislature was interested in a task force on family caregiving, and they nominated 12 leaders from around the state. And then they asked us to provide support for that task force. And we were able to engage students who were interested in caregiving, really outstanding students. And we met with the task force. We provided some guidance on helping them set priorities. They were outstanding group of people. Then we did some literature review support. They want to know, you know, what do we know about what other models are out there, what other states are doing? 
Then the task force put together a series of seven recommendations. The students wrote up a really nice paper that was published that serves as a model for other states of how this task force worked. And the legislature had a hearing, which actually took place at USC, to discuss the recommendations. And then the task force, after it was over, had legs in that the members kept meeting, and they are still meeting. So it was a really nice example of legislative involvement, getting leaders across the state to come to the table and set priorities and recommendations. And then those recommendations were brought back to the legislature, which carried out many of them. And so I think that's a unique opportunity, but a good example of what can happen with the interface between policy, people doing program work, older adults were on the task force, older adult caregivers, and academic researchers, including students interested in the area. Yeah, one of the things that I worked on a little bit a few years ago was dementia caregiving, because it's such a, it's so profoundly disturbing to the people who provide care. That's been my experience, but go ahead. Caring for someone living with dementia is a huge challenge for everybody. And family members, don't let people tell you that family members don't care. They are so engaged and often great personal sacrifice doing the caregiving. And we have at USC the Family Caregiver Support Center, which is really an exemplar of what a center can do to help provide support groups, respite, research, linking caregivers to each other. And that's led by Donna Benton, who also was the head of the California Task Force on Family Caregiving. So Dr. Benton herself is a leader in caregiving. And the other opportunity at USC, two other opportunities, students can do internships at the Family Caregiver Support Center, and then students also do research. So that's a really nice connection of important work in the community, research, and practice. So earlier you mentioned elder abuse and the fact that you have a forensic lab in elder abuse that has existed for several years. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? So the Elder Abuse Forensic Center model is another example of something that's highly innovative, and it's a means of connecting the variety of people that might be working on an elder abuse case. So here's what happens. You might have law enforcement involve adult protective services. Maybe there's mental health support. Maybe there's health care support. And nobody knows that anyone else is working on the case or what anybody else is doing. The idea behind the forensic center is that you have a variety of individuals who are interested in the field as a whole and who are professionally connected. So you have healthcare, you have criminal justice, you have adult protective services, you have aging network, and they come together and they address highly complex cases. And this does two things. It helps deal with these very complex cases, and it also educates people around the table. So we had the honor and opportunity to evaluate this model. And elder abuse is challenging in that we're not finding a lot that impacts it, that leads to a good outcome. But we did find that the Forensic Center on several metrics does really well. First of all, the people around the table find it's a great learning experience and that they feel like they're better able to address the elder abuse cases. And that's everybody from criminal justice and attorneys and prosecutors to adult protective services. So they're better able to. But also then they learn about what everybody does and they take that back to their individual offices and they teach and train each other. So the model is taking off. And a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to do an evaluation nationwide. And we looked at this model in other parts of the country, in New York, in Texas, in Denver. And remember when I said there's no system in long-term services and supports? And a lot of these kind of complex areas, there's no system. But if you bring people together in multidisciplinary teams, they can do a lot of great work. The pay sites do that. Other programs do that. So This is a really innovative, I think, exciting model, and we're seeing it replicated around the country as a way to address elder abuse 
and to make sure that the professionals involved understand the work that each other is doing. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Thank you for this opportunity and probably lots that I'll be thinking about later today. But that's kind of a quick overview of a lot of areas. And I think we're doing better. We have a lot of work to do. We need people to step up, engage, participate, and build community and do better. Well said. Thank you so much, Kate. Again, I can't really express how wonderful it is to talk to you about this because you have such a vast experience and you continually change and add things to your repertoire. It's amazing to watch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, George. And I think the opportunity is that the field is always evolving. Uh, It's a great gift and an opportunity to work with a lot of very committed people and then with students who are excited about engaging. And I guess I will add one more thing. That's our future. That's our legacy is you see the students that go through our program and they're very excited about learning and they bring innovation and enthusiasm. And then they go out and do wonderful things and they become the leaders of the field. And you could see that across the board in so many areas. So I'll end on that. Lessons for all of us. Thank you. That wraps up this lesson in Lifespan Health. Thanks to Professor Kate Wilbur for her time and expertise, and to all of you for choosing to listen. Join us next time for another lesson in Lifespan Health, and please subscribe to our podcast at lifespanhealth.usc.edu. Lessons in Lifespan Health is supported by the NAE Center for Healthspan Science and by the Center for Lifespan Health.